These factors are important, and each for their own reasons. And in the study, we didn't identify one factor that's more important than another. <clears throat> Some become more important at certain times in the response or in certain contexts, but overall, there is no one you know, single answer to it. It's, it's a mixture of all of these different things. And so with that, I will hand back to Graham. Leia, Paul, thank you both thank you very much. I mean, clearly it is a very substantive piece of, piece of work and incredibly rich. Um, and if I go back to some of what I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in some ways I think we welcome, <coughs> it's very timely to have this more sort of detail, you know, unpacking of, of what we mean by coordination, which is an often you know, misused word. Um, but before we go any further, let me turn to um, Laurie. Um, your comments either on the, re on the report itself, what you heard from Paul and Lair, or indeed other observations more generally around coordination and or the cluster approach. Well, thank you very much. First of all, a big congratulations to Paul and Lee. I think the report is excellent. It's covering a lot of the issues that we've been looking at in OCHA. In some cases, it confirms some of the issues that you've looked at are require further work, I would say. Um, it also raises some issues that perhaps we weren't so aware of and that we need to tackle a little bit further, and maybe I'll mention one or two of those. Just say a word about OCHA. The section I head is called the Intercluster Coordination Section. It used to be called the Humanitarian Coordination Section. And we decided to change that, uh, the name two years ago because we wanted to emphasize the importance of the clusters. Also the importance of intercluster coordination, which is really OCHA's core business in the field, is managing the clusters and supporting the humanitarian coordinator. I mean, we see the clusters as the operational arm of the humanitarian country team. And if the clusters are not functioning well, this has a serious impact on overall operations. So we really wanted to put more emphasis on supporting the clusters. And one of the things that OCHA has done has, is um, to request that our heads of office be the intercluster coordinator in the field. So it goes to the highest level, uh, rather than delegating this responsibility down the chain in order to emphasize the importance we attach to having a well-functioning cluster system in the field. Um, I also, in my job in Geneva, convene the global clusters. And we have also been looking at these issues. And in the context of the World Humanitarian Summit, we are very aware that uh, issues around the clusters have been at the forefront of some of the discussions. And uh, recently, I was at a meeting uh, in New York a few um, months ago in which I heard somebody say, the clusters are dinosaurs which will be extinct in five years' time. Now, I think the reflection on that was not so much about how well the clusters were functioning, but the relevance of a sector-based coordination approach in the next decade, especially with the uh, renewed, or let's say, new emphasis, perhaps, on multi-purpose cash programming where we're looking at providing cash to beneficiaries outside of a traditional cluster, but really multi-purpose, meaning that it can be used, a cash grant can be used to meet multiple needs. And so there is a sense in some corridors right now that the clusters have been functioning for the last 10 years. They've done a good job, but the future may hold something a little bit different. And we're not quite sure what that looks like, but we do think that um, more emphasis on cash programming will probably mean some sort of reshaping of the clusters. And um, the other issue would be perhaps not all the clusters all the time. And I think we've seen in some recent emergency where there has been an emphasis on perhaps just a few of the clusters and more emphasis on cash. So yes, the clusters, but maybe not as we've seen it um, consistently over the last 10 years. Maybe there are some new models that will be emerging. And as I mentioned before, cash may have um, something to do with this. But regarding the paper, um, I wanted to just go back to a few points that were made in the paper, which I think we should stand up and take notice of. The first one is on the strategy. I mean, in your paper, you note that um, the partners of the clusters are not necessarily using the strategies to inform their programming. And as you're probably aware, a few years ago, it's been two years now, OCHA and partners at the IAC level embarked on a uh, revision of the CAP, the Consolidated Appeal Process. And the reason for that is that at the time there was a feeling that the way clusters and the humanitarian country teams were operating was to take the projects of the different 
agencies and compile them and shape a strategy out of those projects, and the HCT more or less endorsed what was already being done. Now, you've presented it as potentially a good thing because it allows for flexibility in the system, and I think it would be interesting to have that discussion because there was some reflection that um, it was, rather than a needs-based approach, it was a project-based approach, which meant that the strategies were basically reflecting what people were already doing, and it didn't necessarily mean that we are meeting the actual needs of the people, that agencies had their projects on the ground, they wanted funding for the projects, therefore they compiled this in an appeal process and an appeal document, and out of that we more or less made a strategy. Um, probably your research uh, took place at a time, or has been taking place at a time that we've been rolling out the humanitarian program cycle. It might be interesting to revisit in the next couple of years to see whether this continues to be the way that we do business. Despite efforts to have the HCT agree on strategic objectives, that it's still the cluster members doing their activities, and from those activities we pull together a strategy. And of course, the real interest is what is the implication of that? What impact does that have, if any, on the affected populations? Is that a preferred way of doing business? And if so, should we rethink a little bit the humanitarian program cycle? which is very much, as you said, a strategic direction given by the HCT, an expectation that the clusters then uh, identify objectives to meet the strategic objectives and then activities to fall from that. If, if that is not the best approach um, and the end result is the same, then it would be interesting to see how might we do this slightly differently. The other point you make in your paper, which I also thought was quite interesting because it does seem to challenge an IASC thinking is the idea that clusters should be short-lived. And in fact, one of the elements in the transformative agenda is to streamline the clusters. And the idea is that we should be looking to deactivate clusters whenever feasible. And uh, two weeks ago, I was in the occupied Palestinian territories looking at how to uh, deactivate or at least to give over some responsibility to Palestinian authorities because we have this concept of subsidiarity, subsidiarity at the forefront of our thinking that we don't want to replace the governments. We want them to take on their responsibilities. We want them to have the capacity to lead the coordination mechanism. And in many contexts, the clusters have been active for many, many years. So it's also an issue that's being raised uh, by donors to us about how long are you going to maintain what is sometimes seen as quite a heavy coordination architecture. Um, some call it a humanitarian bureaucracy that's been established. And when I talked to OCHA colleagues who were involved in developing the clusters um, a few years ago, they will point out that they had always thought of the clusters as a short-term solution to fill a coordination gap. And instead, it's actually become the way we do business, uh, especially when we talk about dedicated cluster coordinators. Year after year, there's a cost implication there as well. Now, that isn't to say there isn't a cost benefit to it. I'm just saying that the issue is really being raised. How much does it cost to maintain uh, clusters, 10, 11 clusters, in countries that have been in conflict or have been in a protracted crisis for a decade or longer? Are there ways that we can reduce the coordination footprint in these countries and still have a good end result? Maybe a third point that you raised in your paper that uh, would be great if we could explore f uh, further, what do we do about subnational coordination? I think you note in the paper that you don't have very many good examples of where it's working well, and I think we would concur with that. It's quite difficult to actually make sure that the subnational coordination is well linked up to the national coordination, that the communication flows are going on. We've seen, um, even through the rollout of the program cycle, that sometimes the voices at the subnational level are not heard. They're not part of the strategic planning process. Some countries are moving away from developing subclusters, looking for sort of HCT or area coordination teams. Uh, but it is definitely an issue that requires more thought. Thinking about South Sudan and the operational peer review and the follow-up mission by the global clusters that saw that it was extremely important to have coordination close to operations. 
And so rather than just setting up a body that was sort of linked to the national level, so really becoming much more operationally focused at the subnational level. But here you have quite a significant capacity gap, I would say. Rarely will you see dedicated coordination capacity at a subnational level, and this has implications as well. So maybe one more thing I would just mention about the paper that the global clusters um, are working on with a consultant is, while this paper has looked at the clusters, and I think you've done an absolutely excellent job, there's also the question of the intercluster coordination group. How do clusters function together? One of the things that I have to say, um, I've really noticed in my job as intercluster coordinator at the global level, is how different clusters are. They're almost like different individuals that I work with, 10 different people. They all have their personalities and the way that they function. This doesn't come out in the paper so much. You get a sense that clusters are all the same. And, you know, but they, I would be interested to hear how do they differ dependent on how they're managed, their membership, the type of work that they do. And, um, and the challenge for us is to bring these very diverse clusters together and see what kinds of joint um, outcomes, collective outcomes, we can achieve. Of course, we configure this very much around the program cycle, so that is joint preparedness. There's been a huge amount of, uh, I would say, interest on the part of member states and donors on joint assessments, joint planning. And of course, this is because we're trying to avoid a siloed response. We don't want to see a response that's broken down by sectors. So we really want to have uh, a joined up response. What does that mean for your coordination model? If we want a joined up response that's not highly siloed, um, which is really meeting the needs of the affected population, does an alignment approach work? Is that enough? Are we going to get the same results? Maybe uh, a final word. One of, the, one of the lessons that we've been drawing from our operational peer reviews and our own experience in the field um, that I would just like to point out because you emphasize it in your paper is the role of cluster lead agencies. The importance of the clusters being independent from these cluster lead agencies. Yet at the same time, the cluster lead agencies represent the clusters in the humanitarian country teams. And we've seen this as a, quite a big challenge that needs to be looked at a little bit further. The degree by which the cluster lead agencies really are representing the clusters and also the degree by which the humanitarian country team is really providing strategic direction to the clusters and to the intercluster coordination group. Because in essence, you have the clusters that may be functioning well and you have the intercluster coordination group, but if the three are not working in harmony, the HCT, which sets the strategic direction of the humanitarian operation, the intercluster coordination group that makes sure that the operational uh, that the clusters are working harmoniously together, and then of course the clusters that pull in the various agencies into the coordination architecture. If these three pillars are not working well together, then the entire system fails. And so there really is quite a lot of work still to be done at looking at how you pull together the HCT, the leadership, so that they have a closer, I would say, interest and an engagement in the clusters. And this starts with the humanitarian coordinator who should be very much involved with how the clusters are functioning and holding cluster lead agencies uh, to account for this. So once again, congratulations, and uh, thank you for this important piece of work.